I think we're going to get started here. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Michaela. I'm a registered dietitian at Align Modern Health. I'm so excited to be giving this presentation to you guys about the five common nutrition trends. Before we get started, I just wanted to introduce our facility a little bit. So Align Modern Health is Chicagoland's top rated health and wellness service provider in the alternative medicine space. Um, so what does that mean, right? It means that we just don't do any sort of things with drugs or surgery. We truly work to get to the root cause of why our patients are feeling what they're feeling and don't just um, look at the symptoms. In each of our 18 clinic locations throughout the Chicagoland area, we offer a variety of integrative services. So we're kind of divided into essentially two teams. Our physical medicine team is supported by our chiropractic care, rehab specialists, and clinical massage therapists. We all also offer acupuncture and a few other Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine um, services. And then we round out that service with the functional medicine team, which includes uh, functional medicine practitioners and the clinical nutrition team, which I'm a part of. Um, which is a really great way to look uh, internally to better understand our bodies and um, yeah, what's going on under the surface there. We are in network with most major insurance providers and also offer some of our services via telemedicine. If you have any questions about Align Modern Health or any of the content that we preview today in today's presentation, please just feel free to type your questions in that Q&A feature of Zoom, not the chat. And I'm just gonna repeat that again. So the Q&A feature, not the chat. All right, so a little bit about my background. Um, again, let me introduce myself. My name is Michaela Rogers. I am a board certified and licensed dietitian. My background, I've got a bachelor's of science in allied health science from Grand Valley State University, which is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, if any of you are familiar with that area. And I loved it so much there that I decided to get my master's in clinical dietetics from my alma mater and went on to complete my, um, my required internships as well at that program. I started out in the clinical inpatient setting as a dietitian before transitioning into more of that functional space. And I love it here and I love it uh, working with my patients at Align Modern Health. All right, so these are the diets that we're going to be reviewing today or the diet trends that we're going to be reviewing today. Just a few things I wanted to note. Um, this presentation is not intended to be promoting or encouraging any of the presented trends, but more so offering education and information so folks can make the best informed decisions that are best for themselves. And also, I realize that the Mediterranean diet is a huge topic today in the media. Um, but it's actually kind of a misnomer because the Mediterranean diet isn't as much of a diet as it is a lifestyle, which focuses on movement and stress management, mindful eating practices, and so much more. So it doesn't necessarily fit the bill of what we're talking today with more so of those diet trends. All right, so that first diet we're going to review is the ketogenic diet. So just a quick review of this diet. Originally, this diet was created for the therapeutic benefit um, to reduce seizures in epileptic children. Essentially, this diet focuses on macronutrients, so fat, protein, and carbs, and their distribution of those calories. So this diet focuses on increasing fat calories. So around 75% of your calories would be coming from fat, while at the same time lowering carbohydrates. So 5% of your daily calories would be coming from carbohydrates. Doing this puts the body into a metabolic process called um, ketosis or nutritional ketosis which essentially means that your body is going to start burning ketones as from fat as its main energy source, rather than its preferred energy source, which is glucose from carbohydrates. All right, the, a few pros of the ketogenic diet is that it can start to, it can help to jumpstart weight loss for several reasons. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we restrict carbohydrates so heavily that we begin to deplete our body's glycogen stores. 
Glycogen is essentially carbohydrates stored in the liver and the muscle. And glycogen is also bound to water molecules. So as we lose glycogen from our liver and our muscles, we also lose a lot of water. So a lot of that initial weight loss can be attributed to water loss. And also restricting carbohydrates so heavily means that you're eliminating a lot of the foods that contribute to increased blood sugar. So essentially that would mean that you're balancing your blood sugar a little bit better. Um, and as we balance blood sugar, that can also lead to weight loss. And then as we're balancing blood sugar as well, that would help with focus because when we have an increase and decrease in blood sugar or that blood sugar roller coaster, we often see some issues with concentration and focus. And then lastly, we see that therapeutic benefit of decreasing seizure occurrences within epileptic children. And now onto the cons of the ketogenic diet. So because this diet is so heavily focused on where the calories and majority of those calories are coming from um, with fat and carbohydrates, it does require some tracking and some prepping and planning. So you are kind of constantly having to think about how you can fit more fat into the diet to meet those needs a little bit better. Um, with that, it can be a little bit isolating. And at the same time, because you're so heavily restricting those carbohydrate foods that you like to enjoy, um, it can lead to more of a poor relationship with food. And then also this diet is higher in saturated fat. So, you know, a lot of this diet um, doesn't really focus on what type of fat is being increased. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's mostly that you're meeting that 75%. So that ends up meaning a lot of saturated fat into the diet, like butter, heavy creams, and bacon ends up kind of uh, in, into the diet there. Um, those foods, as well as just saturated fat in general, too much saturated fat in the diet uh, is correlated with an increased risk of developing cardiometabolic diseases like heart disease, for example. And then certainly this diet is not for everyone. So those with nut allergies, those with conditions like pancreatitis or any gallbladder or liver issues, um, or just issues with fat metabolism. And this is diet is um, definitely contraindicated with those conditions. And then there's the risk of dehydration. So again, as I mentioned in that previous slide, as we're depleting glycogen stores, we also are ridding of water. So we just wanna be mindful of that hydration status. And then because we're eliminating with this diet, a lot of fruits and roots and whole grains, even beans and legumes, our diet ends up being very low in fiber, which can lead to a variety of maybe GI concerns like constipation, but also because fiber is prebiotics. So those are the good bacteria's food. And so as we eliminate that good bacteria food, we see some may maybe cascading effects of that. And then also with those restrictions, you're eliminating some of our key vitamins and minerals. So one of those noting is B vitamins. And so we really want to make sure that we are working with a healthcare practitioner just to make sure that we are supplementing um, accordingly if we are going to do something like this diet where we would maybe see a deficiency in some vitamins. And then lastly, this diet can cause some low energy, low blood sugar, maybe some sleep disturbances or headaches. And the cluster of these symptoms are uh, noted as the keto flu. All right, on to our next diet here. So the Whole30 diet. This diet is essentially supposed to be followed for 30 days, and it can be thought of as an elimination diet or a nutritional reset. It focuses mostly on increasing whole and unprocessed foods like fruits and vegetables, animal proteins, nuts, and healthy fats. At the same time, it really wants to avoid any processed foods, sugar, alcohol, grains, dairy, beans, legumes, food additives, and also soy as well. Um, you can have the option once this diet is completed to reintroduce those foods listed above to see if any of those cause so, uh, some sort of sensitivity or reactivity. All right, the pros of the Whole30. 
So because we are increasing fruits and vegetables, um, we may see some anti-inflammatory benefits from that. There isn't really a requirement to weighing or measuring any of the ingredients. So you can kind of eat to your heart's desire with this diet. There's no fasting or timing with this food. So you're not having to restrict a feeding time or fed time. And also because we're increasing fruits and vegetables, again, there's some anti-inflammatory benefits to that. You don't have to purchase any special products or supplements. It's pretty much just food. So it kind of simplifies it in that way. And because we're eliminating some of those processed foods that are calorically dense while not really offering a lot of nutrition benefit, we may see some um, weight loss as a benefit. On to the cons of the Whole30. So this diet is very restrictive. You know, we can only eat certain amount of foods. And because of that, you'd have to do a little bit more meal planning and prepping. It would be very difficult to participate in any sort of dining out at restaurants as they often aren't compliant with the healthy oils that are required in this diet. Um, and it would be very hard to know exactly what ingredients are being put into your food. Um, with that also being said, you with this diet, you're really not allowed to cheat or have a meal that is not 100% compliant with this diet. And the diet encourages you to start back over if you do not have a meal that is compliant. Um, so that can be difficult. It also requires that you read all product labels and make sure that there's no hidden sugar or additives that you're not supposed to have. So that can make grocery shopping really stressful and also make, you know, just life in general when you're on the go, you know, what do I eat? And most times maybe people wouldn't eat as a result of that. And then certainly because it's restricting a lot of these proteins, animal or plant-based proteins like beans and legumes and soy, this diet would not be appropriate or sufficient uh, protein for our vegan population. All right, on to the paleo diet. So this diet is actually very, very similar to Whole30, but it doesn't have that same timeline as the Whole30. So this diet can be followed for an extended period of time. It also focuses on more whole foods. So thinking about fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, um, you know, wild game, grass-fed meats and eggs. Um, basically foods that were eaten during the Paleolithic era, the hunter and gathering era, which is why the name is paleo for short. And this diet, again, similar to Whole30, eliminates dairy, beans, legumes, grains, alcohol, and coffee and processed foods. A few pros to the paleo diet is that it has the similar benefits to Whole30. You're increasing those nutrient-dense anti-inflammatory foods like fruits and vegetables while also reducing any sort of processed foods. And because of that, we may see some weight loss as a result. And because we're eliminating any added sugars and grains and things that mostly contribute to those blood sugar spikes, we may see some good balanced blood sugar as a result of that as well. And because it's anti-inflammatory and helps balance blood sugar, we may see also a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. Another benefit is that there is no time period. So again, it's not that we have to follow this diet for uh, 30 days. We can follow it for an extended period of time. And unlike the Whole30, you can go out to eat every once in a while or have you know, a quote unquote cheat meal without having to restart the diet all over again. So it can be more flexible. All right, on to the cons of the paleo diet. So as you can see from this pyramid, the bulk of the calories, the bulk of your nutrition would be coming from more meats and fish and eggs, so animal products. Um, as a result of that, secondary foods would be more of our plant-based foods. And thus maybe we would have this diet be a little bit lower in fiber than what we'd like to see. Um, and also with those fiber foods, also those, uh, we're missing a little bit out on some of those vitamins. So vitamin C, magnesium, B vitamins, and selenium, just to name a few. And the impact on the gut health is pretty unclear. So we don't have really clear research to show, you know, uh, animal-based diet um, with secondary plant-based in there, um, if that affects the gut bugs in any negative way. 
And then again, it's very difficult for vegans or vegetarians to adhere to this diet because we're eliminating a lot of those mean animal or plant-based protein sources. And then certainly it's contraindicated with a couple different health conditions, but especially those with kidney disease who would need to limit animal-based proteins. All right, on to intermittent fasting. So basically this diet is a time-restricted eating. So there is essentially a time where you have, you are able to eat and a time where you're able to, or not able to eat essentially. Um, and they follow different patterns, which I'll go over in the next slide. So one of the most common patterns is the 16-8 method. So essentially you are fasting or not eating anything for 16 hours of the day. And then you're able to eat to basically your heart's desire for that remaining eight hours of the day. Another popular way to do intermittent fasting is called the 5-2, which is essentially uh, five days out of the week, you just eat normally as you would. And then two days out of the week, you do some sort of time restriction or sorry, some sort of calorie restriction. So for women, that would look like more like 500 calories. And for men, around 600 calories during those two days. A couple pros of intermittent fasting from research is that it may aid in some weight loss. It also may help normalize insulin levels. It can reduce inflammation. It reduces the risk of heart disease because of that and increases longevity. It is relatively easy to do and it fits into most lifestyles. Essentially, you're just not eating for a certain amount of time. Um, so you're not having to play around with different uh, macronutrients or planning and you don't have to buy any special products. Um, and essentially, it's an easy way to reduce caloric overall caloric intake. The cons of this diet is that it can increase hunger, which may cause some lightheadedness, nausea, and fatigue. Certainly, it's not always recommended to do any sort of heavy exercise also on a fasted state, so you'd have to kind of plan around your exercise routine. It may increase stress on the body. So fasting can force our bodies to rely more on some stress hormones, so it may be difficult to meet uh, some stress hormones, and it may be difficult to meet our body's nutrition needs during that feeding window, which can also increase stress on the body. And then certainly this diet is not for everyone. So especially pregnant women, children, or teens, and people with eating disorders or a history of disordered eating, as it may cause more of that binge restrict pattern. And then certainly, yes, people with high or low, low cortisol, so that stress hormone in the body, it's, so this diet is not intended for those people. All right, and into our cleanses and detoxes. So we're going to be talking about juice cleanses, colon cleanses, and liver detoxes. So with juice cleanses, it is as it says, we are essentially just consuming juice uh, with no fiber or anything else paired with it. Um, it can be fruit or vegetable juice or a combination of both. Often these types of cleanses last, last anywhere from three to 21 days. These diets are high in vitamins and minerals, but the con is that they are not, they do not contain any sort of proteins or fats. And certainly our body needs both of those. Um, some cons of this diet is that we may have increased hunger. We may have low blood sugar, but also blood sugar instability because as we're drinking, let's say fruit juices without any paired protein or fiber, that's going to lead to a blood sugar increase, which would maybe be followed by a low blood sugar as well. And then we may see brain fog and fatigue as a result of that. And also to note with that fiber conversation, because we're eliminating fiber from this diet, we may see things like constipation and diarrhea, and also this is very low in calorie, which is why, why we may see some weight loss from this diet. But this by no means is a healthy route to sustainable weight loss and should be avoided unless otherwise directed by your healthcare practitioner. All right, so on to colon cleanses. So a colon cleanse is essentially, the intention is to rid the body of toxins through flushing out the colon, which is our large intestine. 
And then this uh, type of cleanse can require colon stimulating supplements or colon hydrotherapy. Essentially, there can be lots of bowel movements involved with this that aren't necessarily pleasant to pass, maybe even urgent, um, which can be a little bit difficult in social settings, especially. And this should definitely only be attempted if prescribed by your healthcare uh, provider. Many of the colon cleanses marketed usually involve laxatives and diuretics, which promote weight loss and support rapid elimination, but one should be aware that they may cause dehydration and a slew of other issues if not done under the careful supervision of a healthcare practitioner. On to liver detoxes. Um, so we any liver detox essentially would be supporting our uh, body's natural or liver's natural detoxification pathway that it already does. Um, but there are programs out there that um, sell detox kits and or supplements. And we want to be really careful when we participate in any of those because that's not necessarily uh, always a great route. And those supplements can be contraindicated depending on what is, else is going on in the body. Um, you know, anytime we're supporting the liver, we're supporting healthy habits and, and healthy long-term eating habits. So um, if these, you know, if these types of detoxes didn't require certain protocols or supplements, and we were just doing more of a food first kind of way, um, that could be actually beneficial for the liver. And certainly it's not suitable for everyone, especially those with a history of liver damage or cirrhosis or any other issues with the liver. All right, and to wrap this up, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some general healthy tips for a healthier you. I like to call these more nutrition foundations. So before uh, you know, getting into those diets and, and these trends, um, it's really important just to focus on the big things first. So number one, just trying to avoid processed foods. These are foods that have a lot of ingredients that often come in packages um, that are found mostly in the middle part of the grocery store. We wanna try and avoid those as much as possible and really incorporate more whole foods into the diet. We also would wanna limit alcohol as well as alcohol adds an added burden for that liver um, and also can promote inflammation within the body. Um, with that being said, we also really want to support some of that liver detoxification and just some of the body's basic needs by increasing uh, more hydration. So the general recommendation for hydration is taking your body weight, dividing that in half, and that's the amount of water in ounces that you want to drink per day. So a quick calculation here, if I weighed 100 pounds, I would divide that in half, which would be 50. And that's the amount of water I want to be drinking uh, per day in ounces. So 50 ounces per day. Some of the beverages out there like um, LaCroix or Bubbly, um, and then certainly sports drinks and coffee, um, those don't count toward that minimum hydration need. And those would need to take special consideration. In fact, when we do drink a caffeinated beverage, we do want to add an additional water to that so that we can keep up with that hydration need. And then we really want to try and incorporate more fruits and vegetables into the diet. So adding in more colors, as many colors as we can. In fact, research really supports 30 different fiber sources or 30 different sources coming from fruits and vegetables to really support a diverse, healthy gut microbiome, which has a ton of cascading benefits. And that leads me into that next point. So eating a diet high in fiber, we really want to make sure that we're getting a minimum of 30 grams of fiber per day um, compared to the standard American diet, which I believe is only around 10 to 15 grams of fiber per day. So up that fiber, help those gut bugs. We also want to try and practice deep breathing, meditation, and really try and hone in on rest and relaxation and recovery as this plays a big role in the way that our metabolism runs um, and also the way we utilize stress hormones and blood glucose and a whole slew of other things. So really trying to make that a priority in your lifestyle. We also wanna make sure that we aim to get at least seven to nine hours of quality sleep per night, not just 
sleep, a quality sleep per night. So making sure those curtains are nice and blacked out and really able to enter into that stage four deep sleep. We also wanna make sure that we are increasing our movement or exercise. Um, the recommendation, the minimum recommendation, recommendation right now is 150 minutes of physical activity each week. Um, you know, and that, that recommendation varies amongst individuals and their needs and uh, different risk factors. But the more movement we can get, the better that metabolism. And also we just see some amazing cascading benefits from that. All right, I'd like to take this time to answer any questions from that Q&A section of Zoom. So I'm just gonna pop in there really quickly here. All right, my first question is, would the keto diet help adults with seizures? That is a great question. And um, they are still doing research. Most of that therapeutic benefit is found mostly in that pediatric population. Um, but there is some research promising that yes, it could potentially help with adults as well. Um, I also have a question here saying, can you elaborate on your point stating keto can leave a person with poor relationship with food? Yeah, absolutely. So we're restricting a lot of these carbohydrate foods that we love and that are in present in social situations. Heavy restriction with any food can potentially lead to a, an unhealthy relationship with food. And then we have a question that says, um, you know, what can we tell us about the Mediterranean diet? So um, that is a great question. And there is so much information that I could go into with the Mediterranean diet or lifestyle. Um, and that would be best served maybe in a 15 minute um, conversation or a free consult. Um, so definitely try and contact us for one of those. Um, all right, let's see. I think that's all the time that we have for today with the question section here. Um, but thank you guys so much again for joining us today. If we did not get to your questions in time, um, in this time that we have here, um, and you'd like additional information, a free 15 minute consult or an appointment at Align Modern Health, um, it, you can definitely find us online at alignmodernhealth.com or call us at 773-692. 6700 and we're here for you and we are happy to help. Thank you guys again so much. Take care. Have a good day.